So why don't we go before the throne again before we get started. Father, again, we thank you for uh, this third session just to continue along the path we've been walking. Um, we are so thankful that uh, you have given us your word of truth, you have given us your son, you've given us eternal life. We pray, maybe there would be people listening that have never received the Lord Jesus as their Savior, we would ask that uh, they would consider it, uh, they would agonize over it, and they would come to the conclusion that they also need the Lord Jesus, because um, it's that important. Father, bless our time and the things that will be presented, um, and we just give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've gone through uh, the days of Noah and what our culture is like, what is culture, right? We've talked about what culture is, where culture is at, uh, changes in culture, culture ebbs and flows and moves and uh, becomes different things. And then we talked about Noah's culture, we talked about how culture uh, gets worse over time, and then we talked about the, the, the thought process behind why culture is moving. And uh, because it grabs a hold, people grab a hold of that, uh, movers and shakers in the world, and they change the culture. They move the culture. And if you remember, I used the, the, the phrase, the funneling of our culture. You know what a funnel is, right? A funnel is something, it's wider on the top, it's bigger on the bottom, and you pour the things into the top, and it gets funneled down into a small space and then into whatever. And that is essentially what's happening to our culture today. It's no longer <clears throat> um, small little steps. It is a great push to move our culture in a specific direction. And that's why I say it's a funneling. Because there are people in our world today that are moving our culture in a specific direction. And yes, that's a UFO on the page. We will be talking about it today. I know that's not a normal subject, but you think to yourself, wow, that's not important to our culture. Yes, it is. And it's not that some you know, people that work in a post office are all aliens, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Um, you'll see. But... Before we get there, I want to bring you a public service announcement, okay? This is a public service announcement. Just in case you're ever walking through the woods and you run into a bear, okay? Just flow with me here for a second. So, wait for the bear to make its move, okay? Just wait for that bear to make its move. Then, when it attacks, duck under it and shoot in of that bear. Then, jump around and jump on its back. It won't be able to reach you with its short arms. Go for the rear naked choke. Choke that bear out. When the bear passes out, it will fall forward and you're safe. Isn't that great? That's fantastic. Now snap out of your fantasy and realize you died somewhere around step two. <laughs> For more public service announcements, please go to www.thesedontworkanyway.com. I told you I would bring smiles to your faces before we delved into the other stuff, didn't I? I just thought that was great. I had another one with eggs, but I, I thought this one was better. So, culture. In our world today, there's a lot of things impacting our culture. And this map shows some of the bigger ones. I, in the time that we have, can't talk about all of them. There's no way. Um, some of them are more on the political side. Some of them are more on the spiritual side. Uh, I've picked out a few, but if you just start at the top, 
uh, the third temple readiness. The Jews are ready for their temple. They have the blueprints. They have the plans. They have the priesthood. They have the garments. They have the bowls. They have the censers. They have, the, they have five red heifers under secure military guard. They are ready to rebuild their temple. Uh, the re- emergence of AI is a big one. Artificial intelligence. Larry, my brother, dear brother Larry, did a whole sermon on it, which I would tell you to uh, listen to. He actually uses AI in his work. Um, I'm going to be talking about some other things on it. Uh, Digital currency. Digital currency is here. Bitcoin was the first, and of course it has, that has gone, and there's all kinds of digital currency, but now you have governments saying that they want to make a digital currency replacing the dollar that you might have in your pocket. Uh, ear-tickling preachers and scoffers in the last days, scoffers, and right? That's one of the marks, and we've got a plenty of them in our day and age. Uh, our food supply. I don't know if you've seen the news, but there have been many, many, many reports of factories and things like that burning down and food supply uh, shortages around the world. Um, Implants, this is going to go along with AI for helping you to be a better person. In fact, Elon Musk was trying to, and I think he got permission, to put the uh, USB port in people's heads. There's also a military application of a a disc. It's almost like a small brain that can be implanted into a human being. That is available. Um, The WEF, I'm going to talk a little bit about this at the end in their 2030 plans for the world, their agenda. Alien disclosure. If you have not been keeping up, there have been more and more and more and more reports of aliens, if you didn't know that. Our governments are talking about aliens. More and more whistleblowers are coming out and saying, They've seen aliens, we have aliens, we've talked with aliens. In fact, that one in like South America that looked like it was, it was like made out of sand, it was really weird looking. Um, there's the poster or the, the thing that Messiah is here. Messiah is here. And of course, there's always been false messiahs. If you do a Google search, you'll see it but they are absolutely sure he's here. Uh, Nations against Israel. You know, there there was a semi-peace with some of the nations around Israel until not too long ago. And that's ramping up. Uh, Evil and lawlessness, as in Noah's day, we went through that, right, in our first session, as it was in the days of Noah. Um, Signs in the heavens, and this is one of those things that I think people weigh way too heavily on, right? Like the, you know, the ring of fire and the, you know, the, the, the stars lining up with the virgin and, the star, you know, and that star lining up with this star and the planets lining up and the, re- the blood moons and all this other stuff. Listen. Uh, earth pains, earthquakes are way up. Disease, superbugs, you name it. All these things. Coming out. And then uh, rapture, dream, and visions. I've had three dreams about the rapture, believe it or not. Three separate ones. Uh, one of them, we were driving in a truck and we went right out the front glass windshield and right up into the sky. It was the coolest thing. And I woke up and was disappointed. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I was like, rats. It's not real. It's like, let's go. Of course, I don't have a truck like I was driving, right? Because in dreams, you're, you're always somewhere where you've never, ever been before. <clears throat> so we're going to look at some of these things and a couple other things because we're building on last session and postmodern thought and its effect on humanity and on our culture in general. So we're going to see some things uh, that may be disturbing, may be troubling, but do not let your heart be troubled right? 
And we'll get to the uh, hope at the end, just like always. Always leave you with some hope. So the first thing I want to talk to you about today is deconstruction. Deconstruction and the falling away. We uh, have a Friday night fishbowl study. Uh, Larry and I, we have all the people. And last time we were together, we talked about deconstruction and what it is. And progressive Christianity or this liberal wing of Christianity is, is moving in this direction and people are beginning to, quote-unquote, deconstruct their faith. Now, you all know what construction is, right? Construction is building something. So what is deconstruction? Tearing it down. And what, what will happen is people will, um, at least in a biblical sense, because this is actually a philosophic movement that is happening in the world, but for Christianity... Uh, it's critically re-examining all your theological beliefs, even the basic ones about God, Jesus, and the Bible. Deconstruction. So in other words, um, it could be anybody who maybe was raised in the church or whatever and just went along with it, like riding the coattails of mom and dad, and they come to the point where, you know what, what do I really believe? So they begin to break it all down and start from scratch and in the hopes of building it up on a true foundation. Okay, that's the thought process of deconstruction. Um, there's a woman named Elisa Childers. I don't know if you've heard of her. Uh, she has a pretty good book. There's a couple other good books. Uh, she went through her own trial. Um, from what my wife was saying, a man came up to her because his son had gone through deconstruction and basically turned against the faith. He handed her the letter, and this drove her to begin to study deconstruction and all its things. So she writes this. In the context of faith, deconstruction is the process of systematically dissecting and often rejecting the beliefs you grew up with. Sometimes the Christian will deconstruct all the way to atheism. Some remain there, but others experience reconstruction. But the type of faith they end up embracing almost never resembles the Christianity they formerly knew. They come up with some wild things. Now, remember, keep in mind what we have just studied, which is postmodern thought, right? Postmodern thought. Now it's all based on your feelings. It's whatever you think is right. There is no absolute truth. You can make up words and what they mean, and you want to get out from under the authority that has been set up for you. That's why this is happening. That's why kids are walking away. And it's a lot of young people. A lot of young people are doing this. Um, there's a, a guy, J. Hillis Miller, He's a preeminent American deconstructionist. Would you want to be entitled a preeminent American deconstructionist? Hi, I'm an American tear things down person. You know, I destroy things. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to be considered that unless it's like, you know, I'm, I'm breaking down that wall so I can build a new wall or whatever. Um, but it just seems really silly. But deconstruction involves the close reading of text in order to demonstrate that any given text has irreconcilably contradictory meanings rather than being a unified, logical whole. Um, deconstruction is not a dismantling of the structure of a text, but a demonstration that it is already dismantled itself. It's apparently solid ground is no rock, but thin air. So think about that when you're reading your Bible. Because let's just say you look at any one of the books of the New Testament. And you see that the author, as you read the book, has a flow of what he's arguing for, arguing against, the points he's trying to make. And any person uh, having the Spirit of God and knowing what the Bible says sees it's cohesive, it's understandable, we see the argumentation, we see the good things out of it, and we see this is really, you know, really good, no contradictions, right? 
Like Romans is an awesome book arguing from everybody's a sinner to justification to sanctification to Israel and how to walk, right? It goes through the whole thing. They would throw all that away. The book is already contradicted itself and it means nothing. That's what deconstruction is at its heart. The book is already meaningless. Now you give it meaning. That's horrible, isn't it? And especially for anybody, I mean, we know what it takes to study God's word, right? It, it, it takes work to get it right. And sometimes you got to know the, the original languages, right? And you have to know the culture, and you have to know the, the setting and things like that. But what if you don't throw any of that in there and you just make it up? You can go way off base, way off base. And that's what these kids are doing. That's what these kids are doing. Why is it that people deconstruct? Why is it that they do this, right? It's not just a willy-nilly thing. There are reasons why. Um, Some may have suffered spiritual, emotional, or physical abuse, uh, even in toxic church environments. And that's true. There are toxic churches today. There always have been. And maybe these people have come out of that, they've been abused or whatever, and so they're looking to redefine what they believe. Is, is what I've been taught really that, that thing, right? And this causes them to run. Um, strict legalistic backgrounds where every detail of their life was micromanaged, that is also another way to destroy somebody's faith, is legalism. Because then the, the rules that you make up become what you walk by instead of the actual word of God. Now, did a group used to do that that we know of in the Bible? They used to have rules instead of just reading the Old Testament? Yes, right? That's exactly what they did. And what happened? The children of Israel then used to have to follow the rules instead of... And then Jesus came and what did he say? He said, all your rules are wrong. Let me tell you what the Old Testament really said. He went right back to Scripture, and he explained it correctly. But the teachers of the day, right? And of course, the teachers of the day, they make up all these rules, but they made ways of getting out from under them. I mean, here's an example. On the Sabbath, you could... You're not supposed to leave your house, right? That's what the law says. Don't leave your house. You're supposed to rest. You're not supposed to cook. You're supposed to prepare everything the day before so that you do nothing on that day. And then it changed you. You could, change, you could travel no more than a mile away from your house. Well, what would, what would they do? What would the Pharisees do? They'd have, get, take their slave, and they'd have them take something of their possession and walk a mile and set it on the ground, and that's my house. And the Pharisee could walk from their house to that thing, and it's not a big deal. And then they would send another slave another mile with another thing of their house, right, mile after mile after mile. And so the Pharisee could walk way because my house is here. My house is here, right? That's how they do it. But that's what happens when people make rules. They usually break them. Legalism. Um, Unbiblical attitudes in the church culture. Do we have that today? Absolutely. A lot of churches abusing children. A lot of churches abusing people. A lot of churches uh, doing just wrong things, wrong attitudes, wrong everything. And so you have that. Not understanding the context of the Bible, i.e. not reading it correctly right? It takes work to study the Bible. Now, some of it is easier than others, for sure. But some of it, even like Peter says, some of the things Paul wrote are difficult to understand. It takes work. If you want the truth, it's out there. You got to get it. You can, and God wants you to. And then, Social media memes and TikTok videos that pull verses out of context to make the Bible seem irrelevant and Christians look stupid for not knowing how to respond. Tell you what, TikTok 
owned by China is damaging to the rest of the world because there's nothing but, there's mostly garbage on there. And this is one of the garbage things on there. I almost want to start a TikTok channel. I really do, just to counter this stuff because it's destroying people. It's destroying kids. It's destroying faith. And it needs to be countered somehow, some way. Um, <clears throat> it gets a little deeper when it comes to Christianity, and I want to lay this out, okay? Um, deconstruction um, for evangelicals, and they would term this white evangelicalism. So you can already see where this is going has been foundationally shaped by oppressive ideologies like white supremacy, patriarchy, Christian nationalism, and homophobia. And that these ideologies were then cloaked in theological language and given theological justification. Tell you what, Christian nationalism is huge nowadays. Huge. And it's bad. It's bad. It takes away from the plain reading of Scripture. <clears throat> So these authors would argue, the authors, all these guys who are Christ, Christians arguing that this is good, that much of what evangelicals believe is to be the plain teaching of Scripture is actually a product of historical attempts to justify racism, sexism, nationalism, capitalism, and the oppressive status quo. So if you don't understand um, there's also the issue of mix, mixing politics and religion, politics and faith. I am not a conservative. I am, I am a biblicist, and that's why I have conservative views. I am not a Republican, and that's why I believe the Bible. There's a huge difference. And when you begin to mix those things, and Christian nationalism does, right? Because it says that we must make America Christian, and we must make the world Christian before Jesus will come. Well, if that's true, you're doing a lousy job of it. Because no country is going that way. None. There are some countries in Africa that are still trying to hold their faith, and they're doing okay. But the majority of the world, maybe Poland, uh-uh. It's all going the opposite way, and it's all getting worse. Doing a great job, Christian nationalists, great job. Or maybe it's wrong, right? Jesus can come back at any moment, and he will. Consequently, authentic Christianity requires us to unearth the ways these ideologies have perverted our faith and then to dismantle the theological beliefs that are used to justify them. Destroying true Christianity. What was the last point I made about postmodernism? It cannot coexist with true Christianity. It must destroy it. And what is deconstruction doing? Destroying true Christianity. Now, can they really destroy true Christianity? No, they can't. Can they ever, can Satan ever stop the church? Ever. Can he prevail against the church? Never. But he's trying. He's trying, right? Deconstruction, destructive to its core, child of postmodern philosophy, and you can see it. So, are we really that smart? Are we? Are we, though? I don't know. I've been reading a book given to me by a dear friend of mine. You all know him. The book is called Scary Smart. It's a, but written by a man called Mo Gadot. He used to work for Google in their AI department. He's left Google. Uh, he still works a great deal with AI. He is an internationally best-selling author. He's smart. And he wrote this book, and the book is actually, this is correct, scary smart. Are we really that smart? Humans are smart. Some of us are way smarter than others right? But are we really that smart? And where is AI at, right? Because I tell you what, 
None of these things that I'm talking about today, we can stop. Nothing. They're coming whether you like it or not. So, AI is now smarter than humans in many facets of life. AI is now the smartest in gaming. Uh, it started in backgammon. Uh, humans lost to AI in 1992. Never regained it. Checkers in 1994. Chess in 1999. Do you remember that? Deep Blue versus, you remember his name? Kasparov. Never regained it. There's a game called Go. It's that up there. Go. It's a game from the Far East. There are more possible moves in Go than there are molecules in the universe. Did you know that? I will, and after this session, if you want me to show you how to figure that out, I will. I will show you. Okay? So there is, there was an AI written called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo learned how to play Go and win, won all the time. Won, won, couldn't beat it. Another AI called DeepMind created... AlphaGo Zero to play against AlphaGo, the original, and it was 100 wins, zero losses. By the way, that was AI designing AI. Sound like Terminator at all? Robots creating robots? Alpha Zero is now the master. It's the champion. It cannot be beat. Unless, of course, it builds something that's smarter than it. It's crazy. Gaming, it can solve it. Now, understand, basic math moves and things like that, yeah, computers can do that. They can calculate you know, at the speed of, speed of light. They're so fast. With our quantum computing now, that, that enters into the fact of how fast these things can think. But it's still, we can't do that. AI is now the smartest in communication, and that's language understanding and translation. It took, used to take months and months and months to translate one language to the other. Now AI is actually creating its own language. And they can do it like that. AI program student in 1964 was solving algebra problems and understanding English syntax. Eliza was a chat bot that fooled users into believing it was talking to a human. 64. AI is now the smartest in observation. They can create near realistic images, right? I've used that. But they can also do this. In the 60s, we began our AI virtual research, and by the 90s, AI was learning to see by the very act of seeing. It was learning how to see by seeing. Remember the movie Minority Report? Predictive outcomes of people's choices before they committed the act? AI can pick out a rat in New York City out of all the rats. You tell it what specific one to look for, its specific features, it'll find it. We can't do that. It's amazing. So it can also read, recognize, and translate and pick out a criminal, faces. It's amazing what AI can do. They can see abnormal cells in the body. Medical. Right? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> One of the scariest things I think AI did was hold the church service. Somebody essentially went to AI and said, you're a preacher, you need to create a sermon for Sunday, go. The sermon, which was led by computer-generated avatars, they actually created avatars, two men and one, two women, focused on the topics of leaving the past behind, overcoming fear and death, and never losing faith. And it was all created by AI. They created the sermon, and they preached the sermon. And they looked like who people look like. And then one guy 
said this at the end, you, you end up with a pretty solid church service. Right? No, you don't. That's, that's horrible. And you know what's funny? There are pastors that are using AIs to write their sermons. Today. <sighs> the first victim of artificial intelligence. <laughs> Remember Tom and Jerry? There he is. He's, he's sent packing and there's the AI cat. So it's going <laughs> to... There are three inevitables in AI. AI will happen. Remember Elon Musk called for pause in development? Not going to happen. And I tell you what, China, they're not stopping. Russia, they're not stopping. There is no stopping it. AI will be smarter than humans, and that's inevitable. It's coming. Uh, And bad things will happen. Just not as bad as Hollywood would like us to think. Maybe. And at the end of, at the, end of the book, he, he, he tries to go positive. And he, he is in the midst of AI, and he knows what he's talking about, but he says, if we design good AI, it'll be good. The problem is, you have bad people designing AI. It's not just good people designing AI. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Avengers uh, Age of Ultron? Tony Stark had his AI. Jarvis. Ultron AI comes along, and what does it do? It tries to take over Jarvis. And that's exactly what would happen. Just like AI writing AI. I'm telling you. In the wrong hands, technology is horrible. In the right hands, it's good, right? We've got a lot of advancements, a lot of good things, but eh, I don't know about this one. But it's here, and it's here to stay. AI, and it will change our culture. Absolutely. Let us make man in our image. Right? We've we've quoted that passage, haven't we? God made man in his image. And he is the perfect, holy, righteous creator. And everything he does is right and good. But um, there's this website called Humanity Plus. And what it is, and I, I like their cover page, which really hides what they're doing, but it says, elevating the human condition, advocating for a more humane humanity, finding balance between opportunity and risk, seeking solutions to world problems, advancing science and technology for a better, more beneficial future. I mean, it sounds like something you'd see in a sci-fi movie, isn't it? And you think, oh, okay, well, that sounds pretty good. Huh. Well, maybe, maybe not. The pinnacle of God's creation was man. Would you agree with that? He was the, the end of creation, essentially, Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man was the pinnacle of God's creation. But we know that Satan wants to replace God. Does he not? Did he not say in Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Did he not say that? The Bible is accurate. He wants to be like God. He wants to replace God. And so... He wants to mar and destroy those things that are made in the image of God. And who is made in the image of God? You and me. Humanity. What's John 10.10 say? The thief comes only but what? To steal and kill and destroy. Destroy. He hates the things that God loves. Right? For God so loved the world. People. And Satan wants to destroy you and me and humanity. And how does he do that? War, famine, pestilence, right? Infighting, different things like that. Well, this is interesting. Very interesting. What is transhumanism? 
what is transhumanism? Does that look creepy? Yep, it looks creepy. What is transhumanism? Transhumanism is a philosophical and intellectual movement which advocates the enhancement of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies that can greatly enhance longevity and cognition. Okay? So in other words, a chip in your head, a chip in your hand, right? A USB port so you can download information. Think the Matrix where they would plug something into the back of their head and he would learn Kung Fu in 10 seconds. I know Kung Fu. Show me. Right? That whole, right? Hey, I need to fly a helicopter. Hold on a minute. Ooh, oh, I know how to fly a helicopter. That's what they're thinking. But it goes beyond this. Clearly, the agenda behind this is to create a superior race of people, engineered by man, not born of man. This is a recreation of man and a rejection of God's design. God designed reproduction and, or procreation by husband and wife. If people are designed or redesigned by AI, they will not have or they will lose that which God designed. A, being born in the image of Adam, who was created in the image of God. This is their way of trying to erase what God has done. Let me just quote some things for you. According to the WEF, the central premise of transhumanism is that biological evolution will eventually be overtaken by advances in genetic, wearable, and implantable technologies that artificially expedite the evolutionary process. Hmm. Um, it gets worse than that. What are the goals of transhumanism? Remember, culture. Changing your culture. Adam and Eve were disobedient to God in three ways, right? They desired to have something God had not given them, right? God, do not take of the forbidden fruit, right? Am I right? But they desired it after Satan came and whispered. They did something God had told them not to do, which was eat the fruit. And they desired to be something God had not intended them to be, like God, right? Isn't that the lie? Don't you know you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil? So those are the three things. Adam and Eve were disobedient in those three ways. Now, transhumanism follows this pattern. Here's what... They say, humans will be transformed into spiritual machines, resurrect our minds into supercomputers, supercomputers, extending our lifespan indefinitely, preventing disease and decay, acquire knowledge by uploading it into our brains stored on a supercomputer in our brains, remake Earth into a paradise and expand into space to inhabit other planets. And this hybrid human creature would have limitless power. Hmm. Hmm. Transhumanism is the same thing. You want to become like God, right? A hybrid human with limitless power. Reversing the curse, right? What's the curse? The wages of sin is death. And man has been trying to chase immortality, right, for years. Spiritual machines, indefinite lifespan, incorruptible, preventing disease and decay. These are their dreams. Remaking the earth into a paradise, utopia. And that also goes along with what? Those people who do not believe in the Bible and the kingdom that Christ will bring. They believe that man is going to bring that utopia. That's not going to happen. So remember, this is an attempt to elevate mankind to be like God. That's what transhumanism is. You have some people who think this is a good thing because we're just trying to help humanity. 
But remember, that's not the way it works. Because there are always bad actors who will use these things for bad. And even if it is meant for good, it's not necessarily um, the ramifications of it will be good, right? Because we never know the outcomes of the choices we make. Only God does. And some of the outcomes of the choices we make are bad. And this is one of them. This is one of them. Okay? Are you guys all right? You feeling sad? <laughs> we live in a world that's more willing to believe in aliens than to believe in Jesus. Is that not true? Alien visitors. Talked a little bit about this last time. Why, Bill, why, oh why, did you even put this in the slide deck? Because... You'll see. Ancient fly. By the way, how long have aliens, quote unquote, been around? I have a great book here. This is by Chuck Missler, great Bible teacher with the Lord now. Alien Encounters, where he goes through for as much as he has studied um, all you know different things and philosophies and thoughts and uh, people who have, quote-unquote, been abducted and have seen aliens and the philosophy and the messages behind it and all this other stuff. It's a good book. There are other books out there today. This is a really good one. This is the one that I started with uh, when I first got saved. And I'm really thankful, uh, me and, like, Mike Antos, uh, we used to go to bookstores. We, we were like book snobs. And uh, I'm just thankful that we, we grabbed some really good books, some really good ones, because uh, we could have grabbed some some crummy ones, and uh, that would have been bad. But that, that's a good book, anyway. Um, ancient flying ships, when do you think that happened? These ancient flying ships, uh, that was in a Sumerian engraving. When did the Sumerians live? Way back when. Think Abraham, after Abraham, Israelites, Sumerians. They had pictures of aliens, flying creatures, flying entities. How about the ancient flying gods? Egypt. There are stories in Egypt about ancient flying gods. Hmm. How about the buzzing of the troops? Can I buzz the tower? Right? Top gun, remember? That's Alexander the Great. There are stories from his troops that lights buzzed the troops, flying lights, and sent his troops scattering. Alexander the Great. Great flying discs. What about this one? Any guesses? Rome. Rome even wrote about great flying discs. You know what's interesting? Whenever they saw it, it looked like what they thought they would see at the time that they were alive. Did you know that? Huh. Interesting. The falling men. The falling men. Falling from the sky. Charlemagne. And then I remembered my Charlemagne. He wrote, his troops saw men falling from the sky. The Middle Age turmoil, this was long. It's, it's all right here. It's actually documented. And I, this is only part of the list. It's huge. Japan. Japan. And that's from 989 to 1749. I mean, that covered a huge span of time when they talked about the turmoil that the lights in the sky caused Japan. By the way, there's a, there's a picture. Somebody sent it to me. Most of, the, most of the UFO sightings, if you look at America, are in America within the past probably 100 years. Some of the big ones, there's a Mexico City. Uh, there was a big sighting. Uh, Israel. There have been sightings in Israel since they became a nation. Uh, you've had people who, quote, unquote, were uh, captured by aliens. Uh, the movie Fire in the Sky is one. The other one is... 
communion. That's Whitley Stryber's story uh, being captured by aliens. Uh, I don't really believe they're actual aliens from other planets. Let's get one thing straight. Okay. I believe they're, de- they're demons masquerading. But what's important is not that it's happening. What are they telling people? What are they saying? What did they say? Aliens don't actually speak. Did you know that? They actually communicate telepathically because you know, a lot of them don't have mouths because they've evolved way past speaking, and now they just telepathically communicate. Hmm, that's interesting. They never really speak. They communicate telepathically. Genesis 1.1, this is what they say now, is incorrectly translated. Did you know that? Hmm. It, it's not God, singular, in the beginning God. It's those who came from the sky. So the aliens are telling people that it's not one God. It's the aliens. It's your space brothers. It's those that came from the sky. That's what they're communicating. Humanity needs to realize its godhood. Does that sound familiar? Some religions teach that. The New Age teaches that. The aliens teach that. I wonder if they're connected. I think they are. Oh, and they also say everything's connected and you are not. Okay, so that's just New Age. Humanity needs to return to its mother, Gaia, Mother Earth. That's New Age. Uh, Jesus was taken up in a spaceship, and he will return in a spaceship because he's just one of the space brothers. He's just one of us. Now you know who the aliens are, right? You would think if they were real aliens, they would come down and say, you know what, Jesus is who he said he is, and you need to stop being so dumb. But they don't. Uh, Space beings will lead all of humanity into a great unification. Mm-hmm. While they terrorize people. By the way, uh, the encounters that people have with quote unquote aliens, uh, the same reactions happen in humans as when a human is demon possessed. And they treat humans just as bad. Just as bad. Whitley Stryber tells the story of his family who was terrified of the aliens, but loved them anyway. He once asked, he said, hey, show me your real face. And the thing took its face off, and it was this evil-looking creature. And you would think a normal person would, like, run. Oh, no, I love him. He's great. Whitley, come on, man. Well, you're possessed, too. That's probably why. Oh, yeah. And aliens are going to help us to bring about a single solidified government. <laughs> That's great. Guess who they're working for? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, the great deception. Why did I bring aliens into the picture? Right? Um, because of that. See the picture? It wasn't aliens. And then there's the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. The space people teach their own version of the birth pangs, how the world's going to get worse and worse. But they say it's all because of you. You're doing it. You're making this world bad. You're causing global catastrophe. You're causing global warming. And we're going to come and stop it. We're going to come and help you figure it out. But it's Mother Earth and labor. Hmm? Uh, Native American shamans, New Age authors and gurus, and the ufologists, what I call them, all have the same message. And the reason why there's an asterisk by New Age authors is because you don't have to actually see an alien to talk to it. Did you know that? Because they don't communicate with their mouth, they communicate telepathically, you can go into a trance and talk to them. Right here. What is that? That's demonic. That's channeling spirits. Isn't it? 
It absolutely is. But they teach the same message. There will be an instantaneous disappearance of millions of people from the earth. Isn't that interesting? What does that sound like? The rapture of the church. Doesn't it? Everything that God does counterfeits, right? Everything. Think of the miracles that Moses did before Pharaoh and some of the, his, his um, magicians could reproduce. And then there came a point when they could no longer stop or reproduce what he was doing. The resurrection of Christ, the biggest event in history, in the middle of the tribulation period, it says the Antichrist receives a grievous head wound, but then he comes back. It's going to be a quote-unquote type of resurrection, and the world is going to go crazy, right? It's a counterfeit. Even the, the rapture, Satan has a counterfeit for. This, I believe, is going to be the lie that people receive. The government is going to tell them aliens came and took all those negative people. And by the way, you know what they call you? They call you polluters of the earth. That's what these aliens call you. In fact, they say, we do not fit here anymore. And the quote is right here on this page. If human beings do not change, if they do not make the shift in values and realize that without earth they cannot be here, then earth in its love for its own initiation is reaching for a higher frequency, will bring about a cleansing that will balance it when again there is a potential for many people to leave the planet in an afternoon. You don't belong here. And people believe this stuff. Crazy. Crazy. Last, here is the WES Sustainable Goals for 2030. I thought this was so interesting. A friend did this, um, and I only did it partially, um, just for the sake of time. But when you look at their goals, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, like, right, you can just go through this list. These are the things that certain people want to force or funnel our culture into by 2030. And I thought to myself, boy, some of these things sound really familiar. So I started to do this. Huh, no poverty. What happens in the book of Revelation? Well, mass extinction, forced equality. Yeah, that happens in the book of Revelation, right? Absolutely does. Everything that man wants to do, God is actually going to counter. How about this one? Zero hunger. Oh, what's the third horse in the book of Revelation? Famine. How about the first trumpet? Where one-third of the trees and grass and plants are burned up. Oh, there goes your food production. Right? Yeah. How about this one? Um, good health and well-being. Oh, painful sores, scorching heat. People shaking their fists at God. Oh, I see how this goes. How about this one? Uh, the first in the trumpets, uh, one third of all the water is polluted. And then the second, the bowls, all of it is corrupted. There goes your clean water. Do you see? Man has this path in his head to make a utopia. And God says, wrong. I'm going to do it in my time, but you should come to me first you should really come to my side. And the world says, no. He says, okay, this is what you get. And I, go, I went around the whole thing. Um, how about uh, affordable and clean energy? Well, solar, you know, solar, we're so big on solar. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened in the book of Revelation. Is that right? It's absolutely right. And also, no wind. There's a time when God says, no more wind. Well, there goes all your turbines. Huh, build nuclear. Oh, no, we can't do that. Um, how about this? Decent work and economic growth. Uh, there's a time when commercial Babylon gets wiped out by God. There goes your commercial section, world. He's even going to put a stop to that. How about this one? Responsible consumption and production. 
of course, we already know, food shortages, famine, da 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 that goes along with it. Uh, climate action, scorching heat, water to blood, trees burned. Life below the water, oh, fresh and salt water fish all die. How about this one? Life on land, trees, grass, plants burned up with fire. How about this one? Peace, justice, and strong institutions. Oh, by peace he shall destroy many. And then they're going to have a ten-nation federation, right? The revived Roman Empire. Oh, and then we're going to have the mark of the beast, and then we'll just have a dictator. That sounds like peace, justice, and strong institutions. Not, right? And then lastly, partnerships for the goals, wrong. Be one man, and you go along with him, or he kills you. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. This is the end of man. Isn't that crazy? Just <laughs> we really humanity is like Malcolm Muggridge said. We are the dinosaur that's ki- we're killing ourselves, and one day we're just going to roll over and die. <sighs> okay, are you depressed? <laughs> are you? <laughs> Listen. There's coming a day when Christ will set up his kingdom. It's called the millennial kingdom. Seven years after the rapture, plus. And a temple will be created in Jerusalem. And it's going to look something like that. And Jesus is going to sit in that temple. And we're all going to serve him. And the nations are going to come to worship him. And the Jews will be a faithful people. This is going to happen beyond the shadow of a doubt. Man can do whatever he wants to do, right? And like I said, any of those things that we went over, we cannot stop. We can't. They're they're coming. But the thing is, man can't stop this. This is coming. Jesus is returning. Jesus is setting up his kingdom. Jesus is going to rule for a thousand years with a rod of iron. Jesus is going to be the king. And there's nothing man can do to stop it. This is our hope. This is the Jews' hope, right? They're under huge, huge pressure right now. Hamas, Hezbollah, they all want to kill all the Jews. Not going to happen, right? God says no. You poke God in the eye, he gets mad, right? And Israel is the apple of his eye. Don't mess with them. This is going to happen. And this, right? For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be what? No end. No end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's coming. So have some hope. Now, where go? Oh, I had a special section. Maybe it didn't save. Oh, my word. I am so disappointed right now. Anyway, you know what? I do have time, and I'm just going to... Where's that? I'm telling you. Can you see the screen? Oh, you can't. The one thing that we need to remember is who we are. Is there a way to have my screen show? And duplicate? Never forget who you are. Of course, now you don't know who you are. There. Yeah, I am so bummed. Do you like that picture? Never forget who you are, right? 
all the things that I've, ta- I've said here today are disturbing, right? Because it's about a culture in decline. And we live in that culture of decline. But we are different people, right? The old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. The salvation he purchased, and when we received him as our Savior, we became a new creature, a new person. We are now a child of the king. And I love the picture because there you have the king, and he's looking down at his child. And that's who you are. You're his child. And as his child, he is bringing you somewhere, right? He's bringing you home. But until you get home, you're in this world, and he's got something for you to do. He's given you gifts. He's given you strength. He's given you his spirit who dwells in you and will never leave you. And he has called you to be salt He has called you to be light. He has called you to be a witness. He has called you to be ambassador. He has called you to love your neighbor. And he has called you to tell them the good news of the gospel. You are a child of the king. Live like it. Act like it. These things, they may come into our world. They may upset our world. They may disturb our world but they will never overcome our world. Never. Even though you may feel oppressed, you may feel depressed, he will never win. Satan will never win. Jesus Christ has already won. Right? The end is written. You can go, you can go to the book of Revelation in chapter 20 and verse 10. Because that was one of the verses I had in the slide that you can't see because I don't know where it went. Um, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, which is like my favorite book and then my favorite section of the book. See, and the thing, Satan knows this. He knows this. It says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. He's lost already. The end is written. And guess what? Your end is written also. You will be with Jesus forever. So live like it. Act like it. Talk like it. Walk like it. Speak like it. If there's anything, and again, tomorrow we're going to go over Christian's response to all these things. But just, the encouragement is there. The hope is there. Do not get down about these things. All right? It's not worth it. We serve the king. 